grace, mercy, and peace, they are yours. From God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon this morning is based on the reading from Hebrews chapter 1. Have you ever heard anyone claim to be the last word on something? Way back in 1911, the Oxford published Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition, claimed that it was the last word on everything. Whatever you wanted to know, you could find it in one of those 27 or so volumes. You just had to buy them all. But it was the last word on anything you wanted to know. History, religion, science, didn't matter. The Encyclopedia Britannica claimed to be the last word. I guess they didn't know Wikipedia was coming about 100 years later. The Yankee Candle claims to be the last word on scented candles. Author Tracy Goss wrote a book called The Last Word on Power, Executive Reinvention for Leaders Who Must Make the Impossible Happen. I think there have been other books written on middle management and upper management. Maybe you know someone who's somewhat of a last word in your life. Maybe it's the kid who everyone goes to to check their homework on or the person who has all the trivia, the sports trivia in their mind and you go to them at the bar to settle the, the, the debate. It's the person who's a walking encyclopedia and you go to them and you know when, once they've spoken, that's the last word on a subject. Today in his gospel, John calls Jesus the word. He said, is, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. And in what we read today from the book of Hebrews, the writer there says, not only is he the eternal word of God, he is God's last word on everything. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. At various points in his people's history, God sent prophets to them to give them his word. Sometimes, they prophesied destruction, like Isaiah when he prophesied to Israel. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who will look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Hanes, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage but only shame and disgrace. At other times, God promised to rescue his people through the prophets, like when he spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon... I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. And still other times, God sent his prophets to prophesy about his Messiah, who would save the world from sin, like he did through the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And again, through the prophet Isaiah, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And again, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it 
with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And again, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. And in the Psalms, too, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And again, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. And again, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful, faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And for centuries, this is all God's people had. They had God's word. They had God's promise to them, but they didn't have the fulfillment. They didn't have the word made flesh. They didn't have the last word. The writer of this letter to the Hebrews was write, writing to people who were living in that in-between time or who had lived it. Many, if not most of them, had grown up before Jesus died. They were Hebrews. They were Jewish people. They heard these prophecies, were likely very familiar with them, but they knew what it was like to wait. But now Christ had come. We heard in John's gospel, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. No longer words on a prophet's lips or an ancient scroll, but God in the flesh, the word of God in the person of Jesus. Jesus, who himself spoke the Father's word, who himself fulfilled the age-old prophecies and came to be the last word. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Jesus is God's last word by virtue of who he is. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. He is God himself, not just a man speaking God's word, but the Son of God sent to bring light into this dark world. The light of truth into a world darkened by lies. The one who provided purification for sins and opened heaven to all who believe. The one who sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven and now rules over all things for the good of his church, his believers. The word of God made flesh for us. See him, touch him, hear him. But what about the angels? What if an angel from heaven came to you and tried to tell you something different? Something other than what you've learned about Jesus? That's what Muhammad, the founder of Islam, claimed. That's what Joseph Smith, the founder of the Latter-day Saints, claimed. They claimed that perhaps Jesus was a prophet of God, a word from God, but that word had become corrupt. And they, with the help of their angels, Gabriel, in Muhammad's case, an angel called Moroni, in Joseph Smith's case, they had the true word of God. They had the last word. 
of God. But the writer of the Hebrews makes it clear. No word from any angel can surpass the last word of God. Jesus became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. God calls none of the angels his son. But when Jesus was baptized and when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain, God spoke and said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. The angels are commanded to worship the son. They are inferior to him. He is the eternal word. They are simply God's messengers. Now, it's not to belittle or deride the angels. The name angel, the word angel, means messenger. The writer of the Hebrews says about them, in speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. What a high and glorious role they play. They are God's messengers. They get to be God's servants. The Bible says that they always behold the face of God. He makes them swift as the wind. At times he uses them for furious destruction. But the angel's high status only serves to further magnify the most high status of the Son of God. If the angels are so blessed that they get to be God's servants, how much more the Son who is superior to them because he is God himself. About the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And the rest of Scripture echoes this sentiment. Paul says to the Galatians, Even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. He says to the Corinthians, Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Don't be deceived. Jesus is God's last word. But pastor, you say, I've never had an angel appear to me and I don't think I ever will. My friends, we are tempted by much less than angels. Nearly every piece of media we consume, whether it's books or podcasts or TV shows or news programs, YouTube videos, Instagram influencers, you name it, they all want to shape your point of view in some way and somehow be the last word in your life. There are sources out there, you've seen them, that want you to hate certain groups of people. Now, they might not have quite reached their goal with you, and they probably won't just come out and say, hate them. But the way they talk about people that are different from you leads to more traffic on their website and more eyes on their news program. They know this truth. Hate sells. But Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. There are sources out there that want you to try and fix your own life. 
They say if you just try their plan or follow their steps, you will be successful or happy or healthy. You will get everything you ever wanted out of life. You won't ever have to worry about anything as long as you follow their guide. But what does Jesus say? Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? There are sources out there that want you to put your trust in this man or that woman that if they can't be in charge or in power, the world is going to fall apart. That you need to support them no matter what, obey them, nearly worship them. But what does Jesus say? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. What does Jesus say when the devil tempts him to bow down before him? It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There are sources out there that want you to believe there really is no God. That humanity is the highest form of life there is. That the purpose of life is the progression of the human race. That there's no need for a savior. Just teachers, preachers, mentors, or helpers. Those who can tell you how to live your best life. How you can be the best person you can be. But what does Jesus say? When the Holy Spirit comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. But Jesus is more than just words. He is the Word, the Word made flesh. He is God's Word in action. Through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. He provided purification for sins, and in doing so through His death on the cross, He proved the hate mongers wrong. He proved the do it yourselfers wrong. He proved the kingmakers wrong. He proved the God deniers wrong. But even more than that, he provided purification for your sins, including for your sins of listening to those lies. Because Christ, the true word of God, perfectly obeyed his Father in our place, and only listened to the word of truth, only spoke the true word of God throughout his life, and then on the cross paid the penalty for your lies. So like Paul, then, in the free and full forgiveness of Christ, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Jesus is God's last word. Every word we consume gets filtered through him, and that means a lot of it is going to get filtered out, thrown in the trash can. It means the Holy Spirit guides us to be careful about what words we consume. It means we are diligent in studying the word so that we know what he says. God has given Jesus as his last word. 
In Jesus, we find everything we need for life and salvation. He is the Savior who dwells among us. The Savior. If Jesus is the most important thing in our lives, then salvation is the thing we need from him most. He's more than just a helper or a teacher, a mentor or a preacher. He is Savior. He has come to rescue you from sin. He has come to enlighten you with his truth. He has come to free you from death. God sent Jesus as his last word at the right time so that when it's your time, the last word on your lips will be Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. Amen.